Good morning, church. Thank you, Andy. If you don't have a Bible, please raise a hand. We want you to be able to follow along this morning. You can see from your screens, we are going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, if you're a visitor here today, welcome. And actually, if you're a visitor here today, welcome. And please come back every day, every Sunday for the next year. And there's a reason why I'm saying that is that I want to say something about finances this morning, but I want you to come every day for the next year. So you know that it's not a topic that we talk about often, but it's, it's really like a testimony. Um, you guys know that we have had a leaking roof. We've been in this building for 10 years and we've had a leaking roof for probably 12. Um, <laughs> It's been a burden. My brother Nick is, he's probably doing security. I don't see him in here, but, oh, there he is. Nick and I have, I, I don't know, 50 patches up there at different seasons and shoveled this thing off. And he was up there a couple of weeks ago unplugging a drain. And um, it's, so it's, my testimony is, so we did get a quote. We signed an uh, agreement to get our roof replaced next month. Um, went to the bank and found out all our options on money. And here's what your crazy leaders have decided to do is to just trust the Lord with it. Um, which I, I've been on different church boards before with businessmen and everything is, is done in a dollars and cents thing on what makes sense fiscally, financially, what kind of margins we can have and all that. And I just want to say we met last Sunday to pray about this and to talk about this. And we all went in with different ideas on what the outcome of that was going to be and really believe not in a foolish way or a reckless way, but the Lord just said, trust me, you know? So, um, and that's my testimony. I, I'll, I'll update you the costs. We have no idea on costs really. $75,000 was the quote that we signed, but I've poked my head up there and I know there's some decking rusted out that'll have to be replaced. It'll add to that. And is pastor Jim in here? I can't. There he is. I what fifty two thousand? Is that about what we've taken in for the roof? Fifty three, maybe. So that's where we are. Um, everything else is just everything else that we have with a mortgage and all that. But I, I'm good with it. This place belongs to the Lord. This ministry is the Lord's, and I have no fear when my faith is placed in the Lord. So just want to share that with you guys as an update. Short chapter this morning. So honestly, I was tempted to update you guys on some really exciting stuff that's going on around the world, some stuff in Ukraine that Calvary Chapel is specifically involved in, getting some buses in to extract some people out, and uh, Operation Exodus. I've got some videos on that that can't be shared on social media, so I won't do them here. But the more I prayed about it, the more I thought about it this week, I didn't want to distract from the war that we've got going on right here in our own nation, in our own hearts, and in our own minds. And I was challenged by that. The, the title, I don't have a title up there, but the title of our message this morning is The Fragrance of Christ. And thank you for your prayers throughout the week. That started out how to stink like Jesus. And then Jesus doesn't stink, but you do. You know, all kinds of difference. The aroma of Christ and your funky junk. And... Uh, the fragrance of Christ is what it says in the word. So that's, that's what it is. But I do have a question because I could actually hear you guys singing on some of those songs this morning. But as we, as we gather and we worship corporately, do you pay attention to the words that we sing? As we sing, because I, I know sometimes, honestly, the first song or two is just kind of getting us in the right place. You know, and the, that Fresh Wind song is a song that um, we went down to a pastor's conference in Florida. And Gia, a lot of you guys know Gia, um, led us in worship in that song. And it was, oh, we, we got to bring that back here. And uh, are the words that you sing as you sing them, are they a prayer to the Lord? You know, or, or are they petition that song? Here, here's... Some of the words from it. We need a fresh wind. The fragrance of heaven 
pour your spirit out. And, and it's, a, it's a prayer, it's an appeal to the Lord that he would do that very thing. And that's, that's our prayer this morning, that through your spirit, Lord, you would speak. Let's, let's pray, actually. Lord, through your Holy Spirit that inspired these scriptures, Lord, that we are going to examine together, would you speak, Lord, uh, that you would speak and that we would hear, and Lord, that by our hearing, we would grow, uh, we would obey, and we would take on your fragrance. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So we made it, I think, as far as verse 2 in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 last week, where Paul basically says, guys, church, last time I came to visit with you, it was a visit of sorrow. I, it was a bummer, he says. I came in sorrow. I made you sorrow uh, because I had to deal with so much stuff, so much junk in the church. And because I had to deal with so much stuff, I determined within myself that that was no good. He says, it stinks if every time I come to you, I am the killer of your joy, basically. So I wrote a letter. Rather than come, I wrote this letter, this corrective letter that we spent months in together, hoping that you could hear it, that you could receive it and respond to it, rather than reacting to me if I came again and, and there was that tension that you could hear the heart of your pastor and receive from the Lord. And, and that's how this letter continues. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Starting in the third verse, it says, And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you, listen to this, these words Paul saying, out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, or I'm not trying to make you feel bad for me, but that you might know the love with which I have so abundantly for you. Is, is that the way that you guys think of when you think of the Apostle Paul? I, I mentioned that last week, that this, this is his most tra transparent book. This is the book that he reveals his heart as a pastor the most. But I think when we remember Paul, when I remember Paul, I think of Saul of Tarsus, you know, who, who zealously hunted down those of the way those of Christianity, did whatever he could to stop Christianity. But then he gets saved. And when he gets saved, he is just as radical for Jesus as he was against. You know, he becomes one of the good guys and he's all about it. Lord, I'm your guy, he says. It, send me to the Jews, send me to my own people. I get where they're coming from like no one else because I've been in their shoes. I, Lord, I would trade my own salvation if it would save the brotherhood. If that's how it worked, I'd be willing to give that up. And then you see, that, what, what, Lord? You, you've got a different plan for my life? You, you want me to preach to the Gentiles? You got it, Lord. And, and that's Paul's life. But Lord, I don't think the Gentiles like me. They just threw rocks at me until they thought I was dead. But I'm going to go back in that city, Lord. Father, that, that was my third shipwreck. Lord, pray these guys with me don't get discouraged that we can keep going because I'm starting to understand the blessing of participating in your sufferings with you. That's, that's what I think of when I think of the Apostle Paul. I don't think of him always as weeping as he saw the church that he planted and the, the people that he loved falling into sin and living lives of compromise as false teachers came in and um, the world competed for their affections, living lives of compromise. 
putting things of the world ahead of things of the kingdom. It grieved Paul's heart as a pastor to correct them. Not not because he thought, oh, maybe I'm going to hurt their feelings or they're not going to love me, but that he had to. In verse 5 in our chapter, he kind of changes gears from correcting them to correcting, to their correcting a brother in the church. And if you've been with us for six months or more, uh, maybe you remember the story of this guy. Paul doesn't name him specifically here, or, or he also doesn't call out his sin again publicly with this church. But you re- might remember from 1 Corinthians, Paul dealing with this situation. It's in chapter 5 in, in 1 Corinthians. And you can just tell from his tone, again, the whole book was a corrective letter, but Paul says, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Like he he can't believe it. It's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, his stepmother. And you... Church, you are puffed up. What does that mean? When you're swollen. Come on. Pride. You're prideful about it. And not have rather mourned. You should be weeping, Paul says. That he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed is absent in body, but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present, him who has done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when you're gathered together along with my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. You guys are puffed up. You're proud. And you should be mourning, Paul says. But instead, you're open and affirming of this horrible sin of sexual immorality, the betrayal of his father even, and you're proud of yourselves for it. And Paul continues on in verse 5 in that same chapter. And look at these words that he says. We come to church to feel good, right? Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That his spirit may be saved. There's a purpose in it. See that. That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And, and I read that and I think, okay, Paul, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It's wrong what's going on and, and somebody should say something. Oh, but it can't be me, right? Somebody should do something. But Paul, that's, that's just mean, man. If we close the door on this guy, he might just walk away from Jesus altogether. We need to be nice, Paul. You know, not try to be the Holy Spirit in other people's lives. But this isn't some sinner out on the street. This is a brother among them claiming the name of Christ that's walking continuously in sin. And they're all supportive of it. And Paul says, kick him out. This fellowship that we have when we gather together, when we gather this morning and we we pour out our hearts in prayer for one another and the needs that are going on in the body. <clears throat> when we gather together and we, we sing praises to the Lord out of gratitude because we get what he's done. This fellowship that we have is not found anywhere else. They say often replicate, replicated but never duplicated. That's not even true. There's certain communities that are close, the law enforcement community, sadly, gang communities. 
But, but you guys have a comfort. We talked about last week, a comfort to give others the same comfort that you yourselves have received that can't be found at Barnaby's. That's, that's not even a thing anymore here, is it? Don't name out your favorite nightclub and see your pastor weep. You guys know what I mean. It can't be found anywhere else, any, any, anywhere else, anything else. It is a counterfeit. Paul knew how serious sin was and that it couldn't be tolerated. You guys that are reading through the Bible with us, the, the, um, through the year chronologically, it's on our Facebook page every morning. <clears throat> you're, you're really close. You're, you're in a tough book right now. But you're coming up on a story of Joshua, the book of Joshua. And in there, um, there's a story that talks about the gravity of sin. And you might remember the story, you might remember the children's song about Joshua fighting the battle of Jericho. And God gives, if you read that, and, and you should, it's uh, Joshua chapter 6. You can read that later this week. But God gives Joshua and the Israelites the city of Jericho and tells them that he's going to do it. But he says, Jericho is mine. Uh, the, the gold and the silver and the spoils of war. Jericho is the first fruits and that belongs to me. And if, if you keep reading in chapter 7, you find out that there was this man named Achan who did not heed the word of the Lord. And they win this battle. And then, and then the next one is this little town called Ai. They don't even send all their guys because this is going to be a cupcake of a battle. And they get their butts kicked. And many of them die. Joshua chapter 7 verse 4 says about 3,000 men, which was way more than they should have needed. About 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarium and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So, so there was a loss, but there was, there was an impact on many. It broke their hearts. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. They mourned the loss. They're grieving. The people are downtrodden. Their countenance has fallen. And then Joshua, Joshua even gets called out by God. Chapter 7, verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they also have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Further down in the chapter, the investigation leads Joshua to confront this guy named Achan, who admits to his sin. In verse 21, it says, When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took them. That's a pretty good picture of this world that we live in. I wanted to. I wanted it. I do what I do to please myself. He took them. And there they are. Hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. The sin of this one man, sin in the camp, caused the death of 36 men. One man's sin affected others. Our sins are never secret sins. You may think that they're hidden or not seen by the eyes of men, but sin in the camp corrupts the camp. 
And Paul says, Corinthians, this, this is no small thing. It has to be dealt with. Paul said, you guys need to take the fellowship away. This thing that we have that is unlike anywhere else. Take it away and show them the life that he's choosing. And do and you know what they did? They did it. They heard him. They received the counsel. They obeyed. And it worked. It brought him to repentance. He was missing something that he couldn't get anywhere else. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 says, But if anyone has caused grief, he's not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not, not to be too severe. This punishment that was inflicted by the majority, and that, that's always part of the problem when it comes to any kind of discipline, that it's always the majority, not all. People got their own way or they want to do their own thing or they think things are being done wrong. So even here with Paul, he says this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and to comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Talk about swinging to the extremes. Right, The church in Corinth goes from being too permissive to being way too harsh. This goes way beyond good cop, bad cop. And Paul says, hey, that's enough. He's, re he's, he's repented. Right? We're instructed in the scriptures to restore one in love. What was done is sufficient, Paul says. The goal has been reached. Now restore the boy. Before the shame and, and the condemnation from you causes him to be swallowed up with sorrow and to give up. To get a, hey, chill out from the Apostle Paul. Look with me uh, at verse 8. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test. This, this thing I asked you to do with him, it, it, I knew it was going to be a challenge for you. I knew it was going to be hard. It would put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. Apparently, he had also offended or sinned against Paul in some way. For if I indeed, uh, for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Just as deadly and just as dangerous as sin can be, and Achan's sin, if you read the rest of that story, ended up being deadly both for him and for others. So can be unforgiveness just as dangerous, just as toxic. And that's what Paul is talking about when he says Satan taking advantage of us, that he would exploit our mistakes as a church and as individuals for withholding forgiveness. Also that he would cheat us out of something that belongs to us, this fellowship that's only here. I don't mean this church, I mean the church of Jesus Christ. Our fellowship is a gift, a gift that withholding forgiveness destroys. Jesus actually had some things to say about this. Matthew chapter 6, he says, <clears throat> For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I must have misunderstood that. Next chapter, though, says, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. That's some pretty good motivation. But I'll tell you something else. If, if you withhold forgiveness, if you don't forgive, what does that eventually turn into? It rhymes with glitterness. 
but it's fiercely ugly and toxic. What is it? Bitterness. Some of you have dealt with bitterness. Some of you still are. Some of you haven't dealt with bitterness. And what does the Bible call that? Sin. So this is really a double-edged sword that Paul is dealing with in this church. Thank God it's not this church, right? It's, it's this church in Corinth. He says there's a tremendous cost to the whole church when you allow sin in the camp. A holy God calls us to holy living, to righteousness. And if a professing Christian is in blatant sin, that needs to be confronted. That's hard. Matthew chapter 18 gives us a pretty good um, instruction manual on how to deal with that. But then when one repents of sin, they are to be extended forgiveness and to be brought back into fellowship. And, and, and we're to no longer identify them by their sin. You know, when they come back and they're welcomed back into fellowship, it's not, hey, there's that dude that was sleeping with his stepmother. I heard these idiots might let him come back. Later in the book in, in 2 Corinthians, just before Paul gives that verse about us becoming new creations in Christ, the verse before he says this, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't identify them by their sin. They're forgiven. They're a new creation, a new person, born again in Jesus. Again, if, if you withhold forgiveness when true repentance has occurred, it grows not into glitterness, but into bitterness. And that's a toxic pill for you to swallow. Let me ask you this. I've got some experience in this. Who does bitterness affect? Probably not the person you're bitter against, okay? Okay probably don't even have a clue that you're bitter. Who does bitterness affect? You. you. Is it just you? Check this out. Hebrews chapter 12. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Here's the stinger. Verse 15. Look carefully Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, let any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, what's it say? Many become defiled. Just like our sin, just like our unwillingness to forgive, our bitterness defiles those around us. Hurts the church. Hurts your fe fellowship, excuse me. Again, just the same as sin hurts others around you, bitterness defiles. So, we're here. Does this mean that some of you have some stuff to deal with? I don't know. That's, that's between you and the Lord. But I encourage you to ask like David did. Search me, Lord. Know my heart. Is there any wicked way in me? Lest again, like he says here, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul continues on in verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. That's exciting. But then he says, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed. For Macedonia, I had an open door for the gospel, but I departed. And I'll, I'll tell you, without the Lord opening the door, there's, there's no reason to, to break a sweat. Right? There's no fruit where the Lord doesn't open the door. It's not in our power. But he said the Lord opened the door. But why did Paul leave? Why would he leave an opportunity like that? He had no support. This apostle, this Bible writer, 
Paul knew that he wasn't a one-man show. If it, if, if it was important for the Apostle Paul to have a Titus, someone locking arms with him, praying for him, working alongside of him, do you think it's important for a, a pastor or, or leaders in Old Town, Maine to have that? Probably. Listen, if, if you've gotten off easy this morning, <laughs> if, if nothing I've said or read has hit you, affected you, confronted you, challenged or encouraged you, we're not done. Paul has a few more verses here that I think apply to all of us. Verse 14, it says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And I just pictured that. Leads us in triumph. He's, Paul is like picturing Jesus coming in like, like one of these old um, war regimes coming back from a victorious battle. Jesus is coming in triumph. Jesus wins, by the way. He's already victorious. But sees him leading and us with him in, in triumph in Christ. And through us, through us, you and me, in these end times, in this messed up world that we're in, he chose us for these times. Not, not these guys that, and gals that we read about in this book, but he chose you and me. I'll read it again. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are, not we should be, not, hey, this is a pep rally. Let me encourage you guys to step up into this role. But you guys that know Christ as your Savior and your Lord, he says, we are. This is who we are. We are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Can, can you see two different categories there? Let me help you. It's on the screen, Sarah. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Right? But understand perishing it's more than, it's not just those who are being saved and those who are not being saved, right? Those who are not being saved are being condemned. They're perishing. Verse 16, to the, to the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life, and who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. Now, I read the word peddling in, in 2022, and I think, you know, peddling out something. But the, the language here gives the connotation of like watering down wine. We're not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity sincerity. You guys remember one of the smart guys that filled in over the last couple of weeks talked about sculptures and filling in the cracks with wax and sincerity meant no wax, nothing fake. It's all real. If we're not real, if the world doesn't see truth and authenticity in you and that there's actually something different in you, they, they smell the aroma of Jesus on you. You got nothing to offer them. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. We are to be the fragrance of Christ. As a kid, let me ask you this. When you guys were kids, did you ever hug your grandmother? Or, or maybe some sweet old lady at church and then smell like her for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> or, or maybe you, Christmas time, went to J.C. Penney's in the mall back when we had a mall. And they used to squeeze perfume on everybody that walked through, like every flavor, well, not flavor, but scent, you know. And you'd stink like that all day. How do we take on the fragrance of Christ? I mean, it, it says we are that. 
So some of that is by birth or rebirth. But scents fade, don't they? As, 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 as men and women of this sinful planet, is it possible for us to take on other fragrances? Let me show you one more verse. Oops. Let me show you a few more verses. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. You guys might remember this when we went through this. Just the first verse. Dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. What does, what does that mean? Even if you've got the old gallon size, old spice. It only takes a few flies in that ointment to make it stink. Even though most of that jug smells just like your grandpop, you know, or it did. It doesn't take a lot to corrupt the whole jug or to pervert it, to bring rot. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. You guys have all known men and women who have destroyed their reputation, their ministry, their family by having flies in the ointment. King, I, I don't think there's ever been a more important time in history for us to smell like Jesus. For us to be saturated in Jesus so that when you or I walk into some place, now, that the fragrance would be so strong that they can smell you before you get there. Or after you leave, that your presence has a lingering effect that lasts, has an impact everywhere that you go. You guys realize when it, when it says that you are this, that that's actually already the case? When you walk into a, a place, when you interact with other Christians here or in your growth group, we have contact with coworkers or friends or family that aren't saved. In both of those places, you are the fragrance of Christ that leads to life or the fragrance that brings conviction to those that need Jesus. Or, if you've got enough dead flies in your life, they can't smell them at all. Because you've started to rot. And, and what they smell is, is you. If, if you don't know if that might be you, you can ask Pastor Jim after the service. You can go before the Lord. And ask him. Or you can just be honest with yourself and repent. And, and when you do that, welcome home that hug that you receive from Jesus. Will refresh in your scent. And don't let it fade. Listen, I know we're like borderline on our time, okay? <laughs> borderline. I still got an hour and a half. <laughs> Would you guys do me a favor? That song, will you guys come back up here? Fresh wind. I know I'm messing up your recording. Don't care. Um, but listen, will you sing? I know it's kind of a mellow song, but will you guys sing the words? Look at the words that you're singing and sing that as a battle cry because that's what we need. Paul knew that he was not a one-man show and neither am I and neither of you. We need the spirit of God in us that we would be what the word of God says that we are the fragrance of Christ.
ask for more of you. God, I pray that uh, what we've heard today and what you've spoken would uh, just cause change in our hearts. Lord, I pray that uh, that you would be the focus of our week. Lord, uh, we thank you for today, Lord. We just love you and honor you. In your name, amen.